continuation of the previous topic. You mean, uh, we had a couple of slides on vasovagal syncope. So actually my emphasis was on unvasovagal syncope. This is actually a measure of the syncope that we see in practice. Essentially, the syncope is defined as uh, transient loss of consciousness. And then many times we have distinguish between syncope mimicker, basically. Often times we see uh, young girls uh, who come in with uh, pseudo syncope. It's mostly cited in it. Also, we need to distinguish syncope from seizures. So what cardiologists get to see is, I mean, once make a distinction, they are, they are four, in, uh, four kind of syncopes. Majority of the syncopes that we see are neuro, neurally mediated syncope, or what we call it, vasovagal syncope. The second common that we see is cardiac arrhythmias, which are actually ominous, need to be treated. And uh, the, anyway, vasovagal has a good prognosis. The other two, less common, although, we, uh, although it's seen, is orthostatic hypertension, essentially, after drug therapy in elderly, and syncope is a structural heart disease. But again, uh, they don't manifest as syncope alone, they have all other manifestations, so they are lesser, uh, I mean, the syncope is a lesser uh, form of presentation in the structural heart disease, essentially meaning high risk and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, uh, I mean, it's a symptom, syn syncope is a symptom and not a diagnosis, it's usually self limited loss of consciousness, and portion of it's relatively rapid in onset and has variable warnings in terms of prolonged could differ from patient to patient. And it usually has a spontaneous, complete, initially prompt recovery without medical assessment. And remind is underlying all this is a transient global cerebral hypoperfusion as you mentioned. Uh, I'll be short, I'll not I mean, uh, I'll have four or five slides on etiology and prevalence, a few slides on diagnosis. I will skip specific uh, conditions treatment, which I have actually kept a lot of slides in long QT and the channel of these Brugada for want of time. Maybe if time permits, I will have three four case studies. I should take at the maximum, say, uh, 15 minutes ago. So, etiology in prevalence, like already allu alluded to, the most, uh, majority of the time, at least 30 percent of the time, we may not be able to make a diagnosis in book. As long as they are very rare, say once in uh, one episode, we tend to follow them and then keep on searching for a cause. But the rest of the 70% of the times we will be able to make a diagnosis of the etiology. Uh, the most commonest one is usually vasovagal or neurally mediated. And uh, in that, it also comprises the character sinus which is seen elderly. Character sinus is usually due to sensitivity when they uh, and the character barrel is the Situation of syncopes like cough and uh, post mixture also fall into this group. And this is the common syncope in practice. The second common would be cardiac arrhythmias, which actually ominous and need to be treated properly. And they comprise both bradyarrhythmias. and tachy arrhythmias. Um, bradyarrhythmias arrhythmias usually is seen in elderly, either with six sinus syndrome and AV, AV nodal disease. Tachy arrhythmias you can see in both uh, starting from second decade onwards. And these are ominous uh, uh, arrhythmias that need to be treated. Uh, in elderly, it's usually leading a secondary to post micron infarction. In the group, it's usually channel of it is the so called long QT syndrome, short QT syndrome, Brugera syndrome, and category of CPVD. Uh, SPT usually do not present with syncope except in elderly, and uh, usually present with pre syncope or light headedness, and uh, SPT is usually benign and prognosis uh, is good. The, th the other, other syncopes are uh, in structural heart disease like hydrogen stenosis and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and uh, they usually have other manifestations. So the, when, you, when people discuss syncope, they don't put it in the, put it in the discussion. The other one, in elderly, is drug-induced uh, orthostatic hypertension. And uh, I, I already mentioned to you the cytogenic uh, syncope. So essentially, this is compromise uh, the spectrum of syncope. And of all these, the most important ones are arrhythmic syncopes and neurally mediated syncopes. Uh, to classify syncopes, uh, cardiac is 20%, non-cardiac is 50%. And unknown is 30 but non cardiac essentially, majority of the cases are vascularly mediated syncopes. Uh, the cardiac syncopes are predominantly arrhythmic. To go further into subdividing that, cardiac 85% is arrhythmic, uh, rest all the mechanics like AS and uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Valley pulmonary embolism and pulmonary hypertension, severe PH can present, idiopathic pulmonary hypertension can present with syncope. Hydric dissection may also occasion present as a syncope as the first manifestation. And non cardiac uh, is predominantly vasodilated and orthostatic hypertension. And we need to distinguish this from the uh, seizures and GI and conversion reactions. And if you divide by age group again in the end, it's usually vasodilated. And there is a need to condition this system uh, involving this slide, AV node and SV node. This slide just gives you an overall perspective of 
uh, what we see actually uh, in the different different age groups, like in trenches, uh, in between 10 and 39, predominantly it is neurotrogenic, and 10% of them are arrhythmic. As we grow older, over 17 and above, uh, there is a significant number of arrhythmic uh, syncopes. We need to distinguish syncope mimics like acute or alcohol intoxication, seizures, sleep disorders, somatization disorders, trauma, concussion, sometimes hypoglycemia and hyperventilation. Uh, this is a uh, slide from uh, published uh, in 2002. We looked at the planning and perhaps where they showed that if it is naturally a syncope, their survival is almost similar to now patient growth syncope. But if you take in the other spectrum of cardiac arrhythmia, the red one, their survival is significantly reduced. And the other syncope line were in between. Victory is also diagnosis. Essentially, history, history is the premise in uh, evaluating synco. A good history will almost clean the diagnosis. Uh, you need to look into the circumstances of the recent event. Uh, uh, I will the code of the event is very useful. Symptoms are answered. Like somebody has a preceding palpitation, we tend to go towards arrhythmic. Uh, arrhythmic. Somebody has been standing for long, we try to go towards gastroidal synco. We need to look at the medication to rule out orthostatic hypertension. We need to look into certain of remote syncopes and whether they all uh, had similar circumstances to look at situations in co. And obviously if somebody has concomitant cardiac disease is going to be arrhythmic or structural. And uh, present the family history uh, sudden cardiac disease is always lead you to this channel of disease. And they are the more worst of the uh, happen the name and uh, this uh, long QD syndrome and short QD syndrome are important to, to make a diagnosis. And when it is neurology, we always get neurologists help. Uh, many times it's difficult to distinguish it. Seizures can secondarily produce vagal phenomena. And when you put in a hold up, uh, with the seizure, you will find uh, uh, bradycardia. And people sometimes have wrongly gone ahead and implanted pacemakers, which is wrong. And, I mean, uh, again, obviously, we'll all see vital signs. Look into the ECG and echo. Look for long QT pre excitation. W syndrome is one another cause of symptoms. Especially when they have atrial, atrial fibrillation, they tend to conduct faster into the ventricle. Atrial becomes weak, weak, ventricle fibrillation, and, that, and then that can lead on to syncope and sometimes turn out fatal. Uh, I will emphasize on two studies which, uh, as an electrophysiologist, we actually evaluate patients with syncope. One is the head up tilt test, and another is the electrophysiology study. Obviously, a whole one thing is done often, but the yield is not much because. If, if the syncope is too often, then obviously when a 24 hour hold you may pick up something. But if, if it happens too far in between, a hold may not be useful. Uh, the companies are coming, coming out with uh, Isla in, in sort of a loop recorder. This is not, uh, I shall be damn not used to it, classically seen in fellowships uh, in abroad. Uh, they are getting out another external, external loop record, possibly an extended holder which will work for 7 days. The yield is going to be higher. Uh, but we often use the head-up tilt test and electrophysiology to rule out a lot of things. Head-up tilt test helps help you to kind of reach a diagnosis towards vascular info. An EP study, electrophysiology study, where we put in catheters in the chambers and uh, look at the arrhythmias and connection system, helps you kind of reach a diagnosis. Uh, I will skip through the initial monitor. And essentially, it comprises uh, your diagnostic plan, comprises the initial examination, monitoring the holter or the event recorder. Going on to cardiac imaging with echo and for some time MRI to look for scars in the myocardium and special investigations are head up till, till test and electrophysiology study. This slide tells you the way it leaves and uh, like I told you, history will kind of be even the uh, etiology uh, at least 40% of the time and additional investigations go in most of the time. Nevertheless, end up at 30% of the times you may not have an etiology. We always get the neurology into the picture to rule out neurological causes. And I'll go through the data uh, and protocols kind of vary between hospitals, but uniformly uh, what people do is you keep a patient flat to find for 30 minutes and then till the patient to, it's called a separate table, uh, till to 30 degree and kind of uh, get in the situation in which the patient gets into synco. Uh, we use uh, potentiating like isoprenin or anatoglycin to increase the yield of uh, positivity. So this is uh, when we put the patient on a head and tell test, we both monitor arterial EP and the ECG and we tell them a patient is prone for vasovagal syncope suddenly gets into bradi and, and uh, hypertension. That tells us that this patient is prone for vasovagal syncope and possibly the syncope was uh, a vasovagal one. And the response is uh, called type 1 uh, 
I do A, do B, and C. We are not going to uh, detail, but roughly, we can divide the response into cardio inhibitory and vasodepressant. Cardio inhibitory means predominant fall in heart rate, vasodepressant predominant fall in BP. Uh, this is important to make a distinction because if it is cardio inhibitory alone, only the heart rate is going down. Sometimes the benefit of the pacemaker. For cardio depressor, where only the BP goes down, no, I mean, uh, it's only a, uh, you are, I mean, pacemaker is not going to work because of the BP that's falling. So what we advise them is, uh, tilt, we call it tilt training and uh, fluids and kind of ratios. And tilt training is a uh, method where we ask patients to uh, stand against the wall morning and evening, starting in five minutes and keep on going up to 30 minutes over a month or so. So that actually uh, helps them avoid this, uh, the number, amount of, the number of episodes in COP do come down when, once you train them with the filter. The important BP study is it's useful, useful to find out if you can induce a BP on the, in the table. Then if they are prone for easy invisible BP, then probably the syncope is due to BP. You can also study the essay node by something called something called sinus node recovery time. Uh, that actually tells us the uh, sinus node's uh, function. You can also induce SVT and see if SVT is causing the supraventricular packet and that, if that's causing hypertension. We do something called the HV interval. That's the his bundle. SA node, his bundle is the uh, his bundle electrogram and the ventricular. The HV interval is the normal value is 45 milliseconds. Suppose instead we find a prolonged HV interval that actually indicates the conduction system disorder. So and this is raw algorithm. I mean, it's not a syncope. Obviously, you don't reach. If it's a syncope, clearly, and if there is telltale evidence on the ECG or an echo, we straight away go and treat. The problem is with patients in the in between, the gray area, where you need to kind of depends on the level of suspicion threshold, level of suspicion, how frequent they get a syncope. And I mean, this section actually is prominently long QT and uh, Brugger syndrome. I mean, for want of time, I, mean, I can skip that and just go through three case studies. That may be more interesting. <laughs> this is three cases. So this is a 15 year old girl, wrong standing in the morning brain school, pain. Had to wrong, uh, you want to treat symptoms. Preceding the fall, and sweating, nausea, hyperventilation, balance. Regain conscious immunity, history of similar episodes in the past. So, next step on diagnosis <coughs> ECG will not reveal anything. So, how do you, con I mean, I am sure you got uh, the diagnosis. So, what is the, what is the next step and confirm it if it is clearly vasodilated? Just head up to the test. If she has a similar event on the head of synthesis, most likely it is vasovagal syncope. Vasovagal syncope is treated mainly with radiation, like a total reassurance, after they take a lot of fluids. Head of the uh, training is what we call, uh, like I alluded uh, earlier. So, neurocardiogenic syncope or vasovagal is the most common cause of syncope in general population. Occurs in upright posture, sudden fall in BP without, without radicardia, associated with autonomic uh, activity, nausea. Sweating, pallor, radical, it happened in Mitria. Prognosis is generally good, and uh, this test is actually specific 90% and sensitivity is up to 26 to 80% in various studies. So the 20 year old nursing student has history of, the second case, 20 year old nursing student has history of one of palpitation. Only during round she complained of palpitation and immediately fainted. Pulse was fast and feeble, extremity is cold and clammy, BP was 70, systolic, and no murmur was audible. So obviously the next step would be the ECG, and this is the ECG. And any takers? So essentially, I have already uh, talked about this. This is uh, atrial fibrillation. This atrial fibrillation past ventricular rate because she has pre-excited. Uh, she has a WBW syndrome. The, the diagnosis is pre-excited. Essentially, meaning that she has a pathway. Normally, any node, node does not connect as fast as the axillary pathway. Uh, when you have atrial, usually the ventricular rate does not go beyond 170 or 170. But if you have axillary pathway, the ventricular rate can go to the levels of VF of 2 and 2 and that causes syncope. So this girl had a WBW syndrome. And this is 
easily amenable to therapy like uh, with radio frequency ablation, you can get the pathway ablated. Uh, long term management is radio frequency ablation for this case. So, uh, WW syndrome, ventricular free excitation with palpitation. The incidence is 0.2 per thousand. Most common cause of STT in children. 80 percent of reciprocating tachycardia. And only to, the majority is actually reciprocating, reciprocating tachycardia. It's a re-entering tachycardia which will not cause them for. But a couple of patients do develop A2 and then B2, B2, ventricular fibrillation. Proposal is excellent except in those with symptoms of some of them. So then this is what I was telling about the mechanism of sudden death in WPW. Uh, the axillary pathway conducts all the atrial fibrillation, I mean, I mean atrial impulses into the ventricle. So this is easily ablatable. Go, the last of the case, uh, the 50 year old male, next smoker, actual MI at the age of 40 years, normal life. While working in his office after lunch, uh, 10 years later after the MI, he had sudden syncopal profuse sweating, recovered spontaneously. The BP was uh, 80 mm mercury and heart rate was passed, so she took the hospital. This is ventricular tachycardia. It happens in patients with remote MI. 10 years MI and then all of these patients tend to develop scars in the myocardium and this scar in the myocardium tends to cause re-entry and that causes BT. So the first step would obviously be cardioversion and the uh, management, further management of two options. You have to implant them with a defibrillator and also ablate BT because once you just implant an ICD they are going to get recurrent shocks. So ablation is again not 100% uh, uh, foolproof for preventing another re-entry. Therefore, the recommendation now is to ablate ventricle tachycardia and put, put them on an implantable ventricle later. And I'll give it that.